Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight to our wonderful uh, event of the lecture of John Kabat-Zinn. And um, just for those of you who don't know who I am, can we get the next slide? Well, I don't need a slide to tell you who I am. Um, <laughs> My name is Amishi Jha, and I'm a, a faculty member in the Department of Psychology here at the University of Miami in the College of Arts and Sciences. And it's just so great to have all of these wonderful uh, faces looking at me. It's, it's an amazing opportunity for us to spend an evening together with uh, a man that I admire deeply, and I know we're all going to benefit from what he's going to share with us tonight, John Kabat-Zinn. I wanted to take just a few moments and tell you about what kind of anchors the effort around uh, mindfulness on this campus. Uh, it's called the You Mindfulness Initiative, and it's been around for the last five years or so. Uh, we started this initiative uh, across multiple schools, across multiple campuses of the University of Miami, um, with myself and my uh, collaborator and colleague and friend, Scott Rogers, at the uh, law school. Um, and the three things that we do as part of the You Mindfulness Initiative, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, is offer these public lectures, which we're very happy to do. This is our sixth lecture and the largest, most wonderful turnout so far, so very exciting. Uh, we also do other aspects of community building, connecting with other organizations uh, around the community that, that have activities tied to mindfulness training. Um, in addition, we offer trainings across the uh, campus, campuses actually, uh, for the public to, to take courses in mindfulness, as well as for students and workplace programs and retreats. The last part of what we do, and I would say probably the bulk of what's happening right now with regard to my own effort, is research on the topic of mindfulness training. And in fact, one of the reasons that we were able to invite John for this lecture tonight is that we had the, for the last two days, we had assembled a sort of a mindfulness summit, bringing together uh, wonderful colleagues from across the globe, actually, from Europe and, and across North America, uh, to investigate and roll up our sleeves and discuss current topics in uh, the clinical and brain effects of mindfulness training. So this is really a, an emerging frontier in uh, many aspects of uh, what science has to offer. So, I wanted to mention that the initiative is actually, like I said, across many different uh, parts of the uh, university, including the, the Miller School of Medicine, as well as the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Law, the Frost School of Music, the Wellness Center, uh, the Counseling Center, uh, business, nursing, education, uh, many different aspects of the university actually have embraced uh, mindfulness and mindfulness training as an important part of what we offer, both from the pra practice side as well as the scholarly enterprise of studying the effects of training. I wanted to say a few things about events coming up. We've got uh, several other uh, activities and public offerings with mindfulness training around the Coral Gables campus through October and November. And if you go to uh, mindfulness.miami.edu, you can see um, all of the mindfulness-related events. I also wanted to mention that uh, the way in which we investigate and do research on mindfulness training in my own lab is through brain science. And the university has a new brain initiative, uh, which is housed in a, a new building that is just a little distance from here. And we're having an opening for that building that's open to the public. So if you've ever wanted to see a brain scanner, come on by on November 6th, and you'll get a nice tour. And uh, you'll even be able to see the mock scanner uh, and see what we're up to over there on the really the frontier of brain science. So that's a, a warm wel welcome to all of you on November 6th. I also wanted to mention that our next You Mindfulness public event is a, a retreat with a dear teacher and, a, and, and colleague and friend, Sharon Salzberg, and that'll be held at the Deering Estate at the beginning of 2016. So I hope some of you can attend that as well. I wanted to also end really by saying that this lecture series and really the launch of the You Mindfulness Initiative would not have been possible without a, a very generous um, show of support and, and funding support from uh, Mrs. Maria Kluge, who unfortunately isn't here today, but she's been to many of our other lectures, and she's actually a mutual uh, friend of mine and, and John's, um, as well as the College of Arts and Sciences, which has supported our efforts over the last several years. So a real uh, deep bow of gratitude for them. And now on to introduce the main event. I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Rogers, but before I do that, I want to make one more comment. Um, which is really to say that uh, 
Jon Kabat-Zinn has been, I'm gonna try not to cry, um, has been an incredible mentor to me personally. And without him, I wouldn't have the career I have. And I'm so deeply grateful to have you here tonight. So thank you, Amishi, and thank you for our wonderful collaboration and for creating the opportunity for so much of this to be, that's happening to be happening. Um, welcome, everyone. What a treat to come together. Again, our You Mindfulness community, um, growing, thriving, um, learning, and what a wonderful opportunity we have this evening to uh, listen to and learn from and perhaps even practice with John Kabat-Zinn. Um, John is, the, um, is a um, uh, professor of medicine emeritus at the University of, Madi of, University of um, Massachusetts Medical School where he is also the executive director, founding executive director of the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and, and Society. Uh, John, as you may know, is a scientist. In 1971, he received his, MI, his uh, PhD at MIT in uh, molecular biology. He's gone on to publish and research in areas connecting mindfulness and the clinical application of medicine and healthcare. John is a student of mindfulness. For many years, he studied, and I'm sure continues to do so, but um, especially earlier in his career, um, studied and practiced mindfulness with some of our, the world's great teachers. John is a healer. In 1979, he um, founded the Stress Reduction Clinic at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, saying to um, uh, uh, faculty in the medical school and physicians and medical professionals, um, bring me your sick, those who are suffering. I think I have a, a way to share with them something to meaningfully enrich their life and bring them um, ease of suffering. And he did, and so my, the, the stress reduction clinic is in many ways um, as, as known as the birthplace of mindfulness-based stress reduction, known affectionately and for ease of and convenience as MBSR. And um, indeed, as I think you may know, mindfulness-based stress reduction is considered among the gold standards of mindfulness trainings and programs throughout the world. Uh, it resides in medical clinics and centers um, nationally and internationally, more than 200 of them. And I suspect that many of us are here today because of mindfulness-based stress reduction, that there's something about it directly as a student of or as a teacher of or somebody researching or maybe all of those things, or as somebody for whom mindfulness has actually become relevant in our lives through the materials we've read or from what we've learned about mindfulness because of the way mindfulness-based stress reduction has become so immensely important in the fabric of our society. And so we could say that we here share one degree of separation. And I suspect that John, I don't know, is sitting there saying, no, Scott. There are no degrees of separation among us. And so John is um, a writer. He is the author of a number of books, uh, uh, Full Catastrophe Living, which is a 1991 treatment of mindfulness-based stress reduction, sharing with us what it is all about. It's come out in another edition, which is a very important read. Uh, a few years later, he came out with Wherever You Go, There You Are, and a wonderful introduction to and treatment of mindfulness, uh, a national bestseller. A decade plus, he came out with Coming to Our Senses, one of my favorite books, and I've read and I love all of your books, but that one touches me especially, John. And it also has an, autobi uh, an autobiographical flavor to it, which I think is especially compelling when somebody as wonderful and interesting as John shares a little bit about who he is and offers us that connection. Um, and also with his wife, Myla, a wonderful book on mindfulness and parenting called Everyday Blessings. And more recently, a book called Mindfulness for Beginners, which is such an extraordinarily important and meaningful introduction to mindfulness that it's required reading in two of our classes at the law school. Um, John is also a teacher, as you may know. He teaches many, and the number of those he has taught and the number of groups is way too many to go into, but athletes, business leaders, CEOs, doctors, patients, parents, therapists. Um, and when he moves into a territory and he introduces mindfulness into a domain because he's ground broken in so many areas, it's as if the area opens up and says, welcome, mindfulness has a place here. And then soon enough realizes because of the way he teaches and the nuance and the subtleties of what he shares and the intuitive sense of it, that in fact, mindfulness was always there. Just not necessarily noticed and realized and appreciated for what it offers. In fact, in the law, an area that's a particular um, um, sentiment to me, in 1987, long before anybody else ever did, John shared mindfulness with a group of judges in the Western District of Massachusetts. Judges, 
one of whom was so inspired, they were all inspired, but one of whom was so inspired that he went on, his name's Richard Conant, he went on to actually have mindfulness be a part of the jury instruction that he shared with the jury in a case that was so complex, he felt like they really needed to pay attention. And so if you read the record, the actual record of this case says, this is the judge saying to his jury, there's this thing called mindful meditation. It's a process of paying attention moment by moment. And I want you all, when you take in this evidence, this volume of material, to pay attention moment by moment. And so the rippling of his teaching, teaching a judge who teaches a jury mindfulness. John is a poet. For those of you who have ever heard him speak, if you've ever read anything he's written, then you know he, it is, from the, it is the, that of the voice of a gifted poet. And how else, perhaps, could somebody share across the world in such a meaningful and enriched way, transforming and inspiring lives, the work that he has and continues to do, and many of us do, as a um, measure of thanks and gratitude and further offering, than a poet. John's father was a, an extraordinarily um, wonderful um, researcher and scientist. His mother is a gifted artist. I cannot imagine uh, another human being so fully and beautifully embodying the marriage of art and science. Please join me in welcoming John kabat -Zinn. Well, I don't know quite what to do after an introduction <laughs> like that. It was uh, very, very touching, Scott, and um, thank you. And thank you for coming out on Friday early evening at the end of a long week. Um, and thank uh, Amishi, thanks to Amishi Ja and Scott and uh, the entire, you know, sort of uh, administration of this university for um, creating such a beautiful home for this, this kind of work and understanding the, the potential repercussions of it throughout the university. It's just like, actually a, a cutting edge gesture uh, that really marries a lot of different uh, streams with which universities have been associated for hundreds of years uh, and are bringing you know, sort of to life a kind of confluence between rigorous scientific investigation and the deep inquiry into the nature of who we are as, and what we are as human beings through the arts, through the humanities, through music, through everything. And it's a sort of uh, unifying wholeness, so to speak, that uh, very often gets ignored as we kind of fall into our particular institutional silos and self-identify in a sometimes limited way with the, the, the domain of potential interest or the deep question of what it means to be human. So I'm really honored to be here and to be a participant in this uh, ongoing lecture series funded by my dear friend Tusi Kluge. And, um, and really also a little bit awed that on a Friday night, as I said, uh, if you look around the room, I'm told there are like eight or 900 people in the room. Like, what have you come for? You know, <laughs> think about it. You're wasting perfectly good time <laughs> to come and hear what could be described as much ado about nothing, you know? <laughs> because if, we're, if the subject is meditation or mindfulness, then, you know, a lot of the time it will look like this or some variant of it. <laughs> the best talk I could give you would be to just keep this going. And maybe you would be entrained into, well, if, when is this going to end? And it's said, actually, that, that the Buddha did this once, that he, uh, he gave a talk, which he did all the time. 10,000 people showed up. And uh, you know, all the other times that he gave talks, he actually talked. But this time, he just sat there. And then after about three hours, and they didn't have nice plush chairs. They were sitting on the rocky ground. Uh, cross-legged, uh, he, he reached over and he picked up a flower and he just held it up. And it's said that out of the 10,000 faces, there were 
9,999 blank stares, quizzical looks, and one smile. And that's said to be the, the, the beginning, this is of course totally apocryphal, of, uh, of Zen. Okay? The direct transmission of wakefulness outside of any classical teachings. So anyway, uh, here you are coming out on a Friday evening at the end of a long work week, the beginning of a holiday weekend actually, and you've taken the time to come to a talk or a gathering where the subject is mindfulness. And what does that even mean? Uh, how many of you would say that uh, you practice mindfulness in one way or another. You cultivate it in your lives. Raise your hands up high so I can feel it. And I want you to, I will ask you now to look around the room and see the fraction of the hands in the room that are up. It's more than 50%. Okay? That is extraordinary. That would not have happened uh, even 10 years ago. Okay? Uh, there's something going on in the society that's, that's new and different. And, and, and it's a kind of, I think, a certain waking up or a recognition or a realization that we count, that we matter, and that we are already whole no matter what's broken in us or feels broken in us or is wrong with us. Or, you know, and, and how many of you have ever been plagued by thoughts that you're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you're not light enough or you're not heavy enough or you're not... Uh, you know, or it's, it's just like, and everybody else thinks you're okay, but if they only knew, you know. <laughs> and so there's a tendency to actually walk around depressed a lot of the time because we're, we're not feeling completely um, engaged in our own beauty, so to speak, almost as if we don't recognize it. And we don't recognize that that beauty isn't simply in us, but it's in everything. It's in the world. It's in the environment. It's in every aspect of things. And it's here along with a huge amount of suffering, a huge amount of uh, sad regret, of, of pain, and of uh, horror that we, as human beings, um, foist on each other often or on ourselves. And, um, and all you need to do is read the newspaper, watch the news, and we have a steady diet of it. And so we've reached a point on the planet, and I think it's really an evolutionary point, where now we know, not through meditating, but through science, that if we don't take care of this planet in terms of just the level of carbon dioxide that we're pumping out and methane, we know virtually for certain that we're going to throw the weather cycles into a kind of completely chaotic uh, uh, dysregulation that is basically going to completely transform the w way we are going to be living on this planet for the next, uh, say, for our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. We know this. And yet human beings are very, you know, sort of like, well, if it's not pressing, well, like, we won't do anything. We'll just pass it on for other people. We also know that, uh, you know, if I look around the room, I, I don't see a great deal of diversity in this room. Uh, I think that we often live in bubbles where we don't actually recognize the humanity of the other. And mindfulness, you know, couldn't possibly be mindfulness if it didn't include uh, recognizing social injustice, for instance. I mean, it's not like, oh, hey, he's starting to get political on us. No, it's like, it's a fact of life that, you know, there's an enormous amount of suffering that's sometimes completely opaque to us because uh, we have uh, implicit biases about things so that we don't even see what we don't want to see. And we can't, and therefore we don't empathize with them. We just read about the headlines and see the bodies in, in, on the paper lying in the street, but we don't think that has anything to do with us. And I think what, what's evolving in the world, that it, it all has to do with us, that, 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 that we live in one, life is one seamless whole. And whether it's the body itself that's hurting or whether it's the body politic that's hurting, and I would say the body politic is seriously hurting in our world in many ways, then it needs a certain kind of healing. Now, what do I mean by healing? 
because I don't mean curing. And in one of the beauties of the English language is that we can differentiate between healing and curing. Okay, so curing is making it all better, making it the way it was, restoring it to the way it was. But healing, and that's sometimes possible in medicine, but actually there are very few cures in medicine. But healing is something that's always possible, and my working definition of it is that it's, it's actually coming to terms with things as they are. And how could we come to terms with things as they are without embracing them in awareness? And we don't, therefore, have to fix anything or make anything happen. All we need to do is move from a kind of fixing mentality or a, this is not good enough and I need things to be different in order to be happy to actually recognizing that, hey, this moment is the only moment you have. What's not good enough about this moment in a certain way? Even if the proverbial stuff is hitting the proverbial fan, do you have the resources to actually hold it in a way that doesn't collapse you into some kind of um, uh, prison of your own mental construction that then says that everything is hopeless and it falls into despair or depression or anxiety and then it becomes chronic depression and chronic anxiety and it's rampant in our society that we're all carrying around a huge amount of pain and suffering and what what mindfulness offers us, really, is a way to be in wiser relationship with the actuality of our lives, good, bad, or ugly. Now, this may sound very radical to you or very strange, but it's actually unbelievably simple. It's not easy, but it's unbelievably simple. And that is, in a sense, you could say, we're called human beings, but we act most of the time like human doings. That's a cliché. But if you start to pay attention to, say, where your mind is most of the time in the day, you'll discover, can I go a little further? Or, oh, I see myself. <laughs> you'll discover that, um, that a lot of the time, you're not here. This could turn out to be a fundamental human problem, that most of our lives, we're not fully present. We're just not here. Where are we? Well, in English, we say we're lost in thought. Underscore lost. Like really lost, out of touch. L losing our compass, so to speak, or our you know, sort of true north, as some people call it. We're just out of touch. And a lot of the time, when we're lost in thought, uh, what are our favorite domains of thought to be lost in? What would you say? What's one of your favorite domains? There are two I'm thinking of. The past. The past. Uh, so how, you know, and it would be really interesting to just as an experiment be mindful of how much of your day, just say tomorrow or this moment, um, how much of the time you are in the past. Okay? Just to observe it. Of course, the part of you that's observing it is in the present, because that whole past is actually unfolding in thought in the present moment. It's a simulation of the past. It's not the past. Okay, It's just thinking. But it takes us out of our body. A lot of the time, we're only up here. You know, It's like out of touch here, except for certain key moments. And when we're not in the past, where are we? If you just think about where, where your mind likes to hang out. In the future, right? And the two favorite pastimes, worrying and planning. Hmm? And there's nothing wrong with planning, and there's nothing wrong with worrying, except that it's a lot like driving your car with the brake on. Um, have you know, how, any of you sort of chronic worriers and willing to admit it? I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, and, and, uh, Mark Twain had an interesting thing to say about that, which you probably heard, and that is he said, there's been a huge amount of tragedy in my life, and some of it actually happened. <laughs> and we have, again, in English, the phrase, uh, you know, I died a thousand deaths, you know, because we're continually generating these narratives about what's wrong that aren't actually true. And what's wrong with us? What's wrong with other people? I, I would be happy. I'd be happy to even inhabit the present moment, maybe even meditate, if only the present moment wasn't like this. 
I don't want this. So when you fix the world, then I'll be a good meditator. <laughs> well, it ain't going to happen. We need to come to terms with the actuality of things, which doesn't mean liking it. It doesn't mean disengaging from social justice or from action or anything like that. But it means letting our doing come out of being, come out of a core constitutive, if you will, wakefulness that's native to us. Mindfulness is nothing other than awareness, pure awareness. And if you ask any neuroscientist, what is awareness? And we have some, you know, Cliff and Saren is here from uh, August neuroscientist sitting next to Amishi uh, from uh, University of California, Davis. Um, and if you ask the neuroscientist, what is uh, awareness? Uh, I don't think we're going to get an understandable answer, right? Uh, and, and then some people will actually start to talk about neural signatures. We spent two days a, a neural signature in the brain of awareness or of mindfulness or whatever. And, and, and please understand that the consensus among really top-notch neuroscientists is that the brain just doesn't work that way. But a lot of people will say, well, here are the pathways through which mindfulness works and connectivity and so forth. But it's so complex. I mean, just think for a moment. With the next time you think there's something wrong with you, just think that inside your little old head, underneath your little old cranium, is the most complex organization of matter in the known by us universe. And for the most part, like for most of us, the eyes see, the ears hear, the nose smells, the mouth tastes, the body feels, the heart keeps beating, it goes, whoops, forgot, dead. No, the heart doesn't let you go anywhere near any mechanism to keep the heart going. It's like you are so unreliable, you're so mindless that, you know, well, the biology took care of that a long time ago. The really, <laughs> so, and the same with breathing, because, you know, breathing is often used as a kind of anchor for attention, often in, in, in awareness. So that people can easily come to misconstrue that mindfulness is about breathing, you know, because breathing is spoken about so much. But it's not about breathing. Breathing is what you would call an object of attention. Okay? And it's the attending that's important, not the object. It's the attending. So, um, A lot of time, we're just zoning along on autopilot, lost in the past, lost in the future, planning, worrying, driving our own vehicle with the brake on and so forth. We're burning out, burning up, or just using an enormous amount of energy to get someplace else, forgetting that, well, where are you going to get that's better than this moment? Because it's the only moment you ever have. Are you following me? That you are alive now. It's like. Oh, yeah, but, but this now is boring. I think another now later on when, when we get out of the movie or whatever, it's like we'll be better or when I get married or when I get divorced or when the kids get out of school or whatever it is. There's always some better moment that is when it's all going to come together for us. And this sort of radical perspective is there is no better moment. This is it. Sorry. <laughs> the flower. Okay. The, the conceptual mind could perseverate on this for 100 years and never get it. But you hear that? OK. That's because your ears don't have to worry. They just work. You know. Long before the brain starts to talk about, oh, yeah, John clapped, you hear that. So it's the bare actuality of the sound. And when we cultivate the sort of muscle, if you will, of mindfulness, when we begin to train the mind or train our attention or train our capacity to inhabit awareness, then it's coextensive with the body. And in the Buddhist teachings, which is like, again, I mentioned the Buddha before, uh, but this is not Buddhism. Okay, is a very interesting relationship to Buddhism because the Buddhism has probably the most sophisticated and elaborate articulation of mindfulness in the world. But mindfulness is awareness. It's universal. It's like 
You know, everybody has it, even, you know, sort of illiterate societies. I mean, everybody has a way of being in wise relationship with the actuality of this moment. Say the Eskimos, the pygmies, you know, everywhere on the planet, it's humanity expressing itself and finding ways to be in wise relationship with the inner and the outer, with the environment, with the, each other, with others, and with the forest, if you're living in the you know, forest that's being completely degraded, uh, so that the pygmies now really can't, quick, can't survive. Maybe they've all gone uh, from the you know, Congolese forest. And, uh, you know, and the, all the Eskimos are driving snowmobiles and you know, eating cereal out of boxes because you know, they've lost the hunt. So Thoreau, who I love to quote, um, is famous for having said in Walden, and by the way, Walden uh, is itself a, a kind of rhapsody on mindfulness. The whole thing is about the beauty of the present moment. And he talks about sitting in his doorway for the entire day, doing absolutely nothing as the sun passes across the sky, and commenting that I, anything I could have done would be far less valuable than this. And it was like really radical in the 1830s, you know. Uh, and he said about going to Walden, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what they had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. And I think that happens a lot. I think that happens a lot, that we like forget, and we get on some kind of train that's driving through these moments to get the better moments, and then all of a sudden, you're at the end of your life, and you go, whoops, I got the whole instruction set wrong. Even getting everything that I thought I wanted, there, there may be costs that I was ignoring. Relational costs, costs for children, costs for all sorts of costs, or maybe just health-related costs, you know? Driving, driving, driving ourselves to get somewhere else, and in the process, not realizing that we're always already where we, where we are, and that it is workable. I'm not saying it's OK or there's nothing wrong. The people who come to MBSR, they come with every conceivable medical diagnosis you can imagine, and including people who can't even get a diagnosis out of the healthcare system. And we take everybody who's willing to do a certain kind of work. And in my experience, the work of mindfulness is virtually the hardest work in the world for us as human beings. Somehow being present is very, very difficult for us. And so we have to actually exercise the muscle through training, through intentional practicing. And, and, you know, and so that, a lot of the time, just looks like this. Or a cross, hello, a cross-legged version of this. It's like you do something, you know, it's completely, you know, weird. The Japanese call it shikantaza. Just sitting, nothing more. But the just sitting is like wakefulness. As I said, we all already have awareness. So it's not like, well, now let me develop my awareness. You can't develop your awareness. Your awareness is constitutive. It's like, it's like your default mode, so to speak although it's not recognized by neuroscience, because most of our default mode is mind wandering and, and perseverating constantly about our favorite subject. And guess what our favorite subject is? Me. <laughs> Me. The personal pronouns. So you can be on the lookout for the personal pronouns and how you even use them. And you'll notice that almost everything is about me, and my life, and my problems, and my aspirations. And my children and my grandchildren. And it's all wonderful. I'm not knocking that, except that um, it's too small. That the, whoever we think we are, in actuality, we're much, much bigger. So when we take our seat, and this is just, you know, in a sense, 
one way to do it. You could do it lying down. How many of you practice the body scan, lying down meditation? It's a very fabulous form of meditation because I'm assuming most of you, like in Miami or kind of like everybody else, you sleep at night to some degree or other. <laughs> if you're really stressed, of course, you don't sleep at night. That's a whole other story. Uh, but that, too, can be regulated by beginning to reclaim your moments. Maybe your body doesn't need to sleep at this particular moment. Well, here you are lying in bed. You could actually drop in on yourself and fall awake instead of, I can't stand this. I got a big presentation tomorrow and, you know, and getting really burnt out of, you know, bent out of shape about it. What about falling awake? So you have to be delicate with this because if, if you're getting into bed, so let's say when you get out of bed, perfect opportunity. Before you get out of bed, just be awake to the fact that you were lying in bed and you're not asleep anymore. Wow. And see if you could put your mind in your body. See if you could do it right now, sitting. It, you just like, you don't have to shift your posture even. You don't even need to sit up like a meditator. Just like, can you let your awareness embrace and fill and suffuse the body? And the answer is, of course you can. For a fleeting fraction of a second. <laughs> And then we get distracted, you know, or onto something else. So, but what if we could actually inhabit awareness as a space, an n-dimensional space that you actually, that's your default mode. You live here. And that awareness would not end at the boundary of your skin, by the way, so it would include others. And it would include the emotional fabric in your family. And it would include the larger world, as I was suggesting and people that we ordinarily don't see or disregard because they're different from us. And the heart would be part of this inclusivity because in all Asian languages, by the way, speaking of mindfulness, the word for mind and the word for heart is the same word. So if you're hearing the word mindfulness and you're having some kind of clinical sort of conceptual notion of mindfulness, uh, you have to hear the word heartfulness or you're not even understanding it. And it's not a concept. It's, it's not a philosophy, it's not a catechism, it's not a belief system, it's, it's a laboratory. It's a way of being that is experimental, that you can play with it. You can see, okay, well, can I feel this breath coming into the body? Or the body as a whole lying here in the bed? Or the body as a whole sitting here on your chair? Or standing if you're standing? There's no problem. I mean, you, was, you could be standing on your head, and awareness could care less. It's like you just experience what's happening. Is there there's emotional turmoil? Fine. Okay, so the, the awareness just holds the emotional turmoil. It's like, it's like the sky. Everything, you know, stars, moon, sun, clouds, weather patterns, all unfolds within the embrace of sky, so to speak, or space. And so the awareness is simply the space, the knowing space, in which everything unfolds. And not only the knowing space, the, the not knowing space too, like knowing that we don't know and not necessarily believing our thoughts because our thoughts are mere like secretions in part of the mind, but you know, there's emotional intelligence. It's not all conceptual or cognitive. And there's somatic intelligence. And this is already our inheritance. It's not like we have to get it, it's here. The question is, can we inhabit it? So you pra we practice. You know, it's like you have a big music school here, and they say, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You know, you know the answer, right? Practice, practice, practice. So if you hear all this talk about mindfulness, it's not a concept. It's not a philosophy, and it's not like, well, every once in a while I try to catch a breath or two. It's like much more fundamental than that. It's like, can we, and then the real meditation, I was saying to somebody, you know, people used to ask me, well, What's your meditation practice like? How much do you meditate? How many hours? Usually it's framed like that. How many hours a day do you meditate? And I used to say two. And they'd say, well, when do you do it? And I'd say, well, I get up at four or five in the morning, and I have that time to myself. And before the internet, you know, there were even fewer temptations to, you know, to really have that time by myself. Uh, but OK, but that, like, that's the way we conventionally think of meditation. But, you know, as my own practice has developed and as I've gotten older and as my life has transformed and so forth, uh, I, I now, like, I don't even know how to answer that question. 
because this is mindfulness. You're hearing, and you're knowing that you're hearing. Okay? But you're not knowing in a thinking way. It's just part of hearing. So it's bigger than thought. It's not that there's anything wrong with thought. It's just like bigger. And, um, and I'm standing here, and I'm talking, and I'm breathing, and there's all this complexity of like, you know, uh, the trillions of synapses that are allowing me to watch this. I mean, move my lips and wag my tongue in such a way that I'm not biting my tongue, and I'm moving the air out of the lungs in ways that I have no idea how this is happening, and in the process, creating air waves of sound that actually are decoded in your ears as, a, as one seamless, grammatically con, you know, continuous sentence. How does that happen? Language. What is that? And the generativity, I mean, it's called generative grammar, Chomsky's major contribution is the kind of generative grammar. I mean, understanding. This is like, we don't know, and I'm watching my two-year-old granddaughter actually go through this language acquisition, and it's completely mind-blowing. And before that, learning how to walk. I mean, it's not like, OK, now you get learning how to walk Point, 2.0, you know, you a little manual to learn how to walk. No, you learn how to walk by just daring to throw yourself out into space and then fall on your ass over and over and over again and then not take it personally when the adults laugh or think it's cute. And it's like, I'm so humiliated, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to in a wheelchair forever because it's just humiliating to try to walk and fall down. Now, luckily, we learn to walk before we learn to think in that way. And so we're, not, you know, we're liberated from the kind of self-reflective judging that we constantly put ourselves under. Like, there's some way or other in which we're failures, that we're no good, that, that we're inadequate, that we're incomplete. And you know, the root meaning of the word, we were just talking about this in the lab, the root meaning of the word health is the word whole, W-H-O-L-E. And the root meaning of the word healing, same, wholeness. There's a, you know, in, in Wordsworth's prelude, uh, there's a beautiful sentence that I absolutely love that goes like this. There's a dark, invisible workmanship. That you think about the universe. He's talking about the whole world. There's a dark, invisible workmanship that unifies discordant elements and makes them move in, in society. In other words, what looks like separate stuff is actually all part of one big play. And we're a part of that apprehension. And when we rest in awareness, when we learn to actually rest in awareness, inhabit the field of your own awareness, and then not give yourself a hard time about how well you're doing, like, oh, God, that was the most boring thing in the world. Or I get so antsy, I just can't stand it. And you see, all of these are kind of little sort of pebbles in the road. They're like trivial you know, aspects of something that's incredibly profound. And sometimes you know, people get tremendous benefit from actually meditating with a whole group of people so that you feel fidgety. You're too embarrassed to actually move. So you're like, well, I'll just have to accept the fidget, that my impulse to fidget, but I won't fidget because they'll think I'm a bad meditator. So this is all, like, the whole thing is just a narrative you're telling yourself. The whole point is to simply put the welcome mat out for everything, everything that arises, and it all becomes the object of your attention. And you can have what we call open presence or a choiceless awareness that doesn't say, oh, yes, I'm like really in touch with my breath. You know, notice the personal pronoun, my breath. Um, <laughs> my posture, don't I look like a meditator? Uh, yes, and uh, a little wise and you know, very calm. And you know, this is all thinking, 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 thinking. And what we're peeling back is a kind of deeper simplicity that's the essence of who you are. I mean, the Buddhists would call it Buddha nature. But let's not forget, I mean, just because I've now invoked the Buddha three times, the Buddha was not a Buddhist. I sort of, sometimes I think I alienate some of my many Buddhist friends by continuing to say that, but it's, the fact is it's true. Um, the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. Uh, and the word Buddhism was actually invented by Europeans who came and didn't understand what they were seeing and ma making contextual assumptions. 
But the point is that it's, it, what the word Buddha means is awake. People used to go up to him apocryphally and say, are you a god? Because how many of you have been around the Dalai Lama? Anybody been near the Dalai Lama? You know, people start crying in his presence even in like a stadium when he comes in. He has that kind of effect on him. And in Tibetan, they actually refer to him, as you could say his nickname is Kundun. There was a movie called Kundun with, about it. But Kundun means presence. He's pretty awake. And it has an effect on people. When you come in touch with somebody who's really awake, you start to cry or just feel. I mean, I've sat in rooms with serious scientists who are very aggressive and uh, always, <laughs> not you guys, but you know, <laughs> who really have differing opinions and ideas held very strongly about their science and about who's right and who's full of it and all of that. And you, you know, they spend two days with the Dalai Lama and everybody's like a pussycat. <laughs> they're, still, they're still rigorous, but they are much more heartful, much more compassionate, much more spacious because that somehow is allowed to emerge in his presence. But he would say, eh, just a simple Buddhist monk, he says that all the time, he means it. It's that his presence is no different from your presence. So it would be a real dishonoring of yourself to not recognize that this is intrinsic to your nature as a human being, and it's a whole domain that just doesn't get any airtime in school. You know, you're not taught to be aware in school, you're taught to think a lot. And uh, now, with Mindful Kids Miami in the, is it Dade County school system, fourth largest school system in the country, <laughs> training in mindfulness. Uh, so, this is something that's now infiltrating our whole culture in ways that were inconceivable really 40 or 50 years ago. I started this mindfulness-based stress reduction 36 years ago. So this is half of my life I've been doing this work. And with the intention from the very beginning that if this worked in one clinic, in one hospital, that it would actually spread around the world. Because people were falling through the cracks of the healthcare system, falling through the cracks, and not getting satisfaction from traditional medical care. And there's one thing that was left out, and that's what we now call participatory medicine. It's like, hey, it's not just the brain that's totally fantastic. It's like the whole organism is totally fantastic. It's a naturally healing mechanism that we have, or I don't want to use mechanism, but universe that's deeply ingrained in our capacity. So, so to ignore that and just do things like an auto mechanics medicine to fix them when you drive your body into the shop and get it fixed or replace the carburetor or whatever. Uh, and I'm not knocking that when it's necessary, but when you get the person to participate, even in the rehabbing from, say, a hip surgery or a knee surgery, something like that, the more you participate in that healing, the faster it goes, the better it goes. And, and we're beginning to get grants now in mindfulness to look at the ongoing long-term effects of this kind of practice on aging. Because let's say, like, uh, how many of you just don't want to die? <laughs> you know, you'd rather not, and then not now, certainly not now. So, uh, and we all want more time, don't we? I mean, do we ever have enough time? I mean, I want to get to a guided meditation, and here I am. I could say this is all one big guided meditation, but I'd like to get to something a little more formally guided meditation before we close, and then have Q&A. But uh, before we do that, uh, you know, you could say that the, uh, the entire sweep of this is really a meditation. It really, truly is. We're inquiring together about the nature of our own experience moment by moment by moment. But it's, it's really hard work. And so what we've shown in the past 36 years is that regular people 
regular Americans falling through the cracks of the healthcare system. And that was in 1979 when it started, like where there were cracks in the healthcare system. Now they're like Grand Canyons in the healthcare system. <laughs> Even with uh, the Obamacare isn't really healthcare reform, it's health payment reform with a little sort of healthcare reform. But when we take responsibility for our own well-being as a complement to whatever medicine can do for us across the lifespan, the potential is there to influence our bodies and our hearts and our minds in ways that have profound biological consequences. And that's now going to be studied in terms of the biological consequences in terms of aging of mindfulness training. And uh, if you want to have more moments, well, why don't you try to inhabit more of them? Rather than needing more time, you got plenty of time. You got nothing but time. Everybody gets the same 24 hours. To a first approximation, there are an infinite number of moments in those 24 hours. So could we actually reclaim our timeless present moments? Then, if you live in that kind of a way, underscore live, fully embodied, wakeful presence, or some approximation thereof, because we're always moving in and out of it, then, as Thoreau said, dying is not going to be a problem because, you, because you'll have lived fully. But if you don't live fully and you zone on along an automatic pilot and you're lost in thought a great deal of the time in emotional turmoil, and then you wake up to the fact that, wow, I treated my kids horribly when I was young because I, wasn't, I thought I needed to be doing this stuff. And I, my relationship, I didn't tend the gardens that were entrusted to me, as one great Spanish poet said then um, there could be tremendous regret at the end. So my advice, die now, get it over with. And then the rest of your life, seriously, I'm not joking. The rest of your life is like a gift. And I'm not saying it's all pleasant. I didn't call my first book I mean, the, incre the Incredible Pleasure of Living. I called it Full Catastrophe Living after Zorba the Greek, you know. Because if it's, you know, if it's not one thing, it's going to be another thing. And it's like it doesn't all sort of you know, uh, work out to your small-minded desire. Sometimes it does, but sometimes there's just enormous grief, enormous pain, enormous loss, enormous uh, rending, trauma in the family, things that cannot easily be papered over and that require us to actually step in rather than recoil. And, discard through practice, because this is easy to say, not easy to do, discard our implicit, intrinsic uh, um, uh, impulse to fix it or make it better and, and recognize that we do not know how this is going to unfold if we hold it with a larger heartful integrity that maybe actually beautiful things will unfold. Maybe healing can unfold inside the body, inside the family, inside the world. So that's a kind of big, you know, sort of uh, perspective to hold. But when you anchor it in stillness and in silence, then in some sense you're unifying the inner and the outer, the, the personal and the impersonal, uh, and you're cultivating a kind of uh, wisdom and uh, empathy that has integrity, that has uh, a kind of profound ethical foundation. MBSR, don't forget, was started in hospitals. Now it's in businesses. It's all over the place. Uh, but uh, the ethical foundation of MBSR is the Hippocratic Oath. What is the cardinal principle of the Hippocratic Oath? First, do no harm. So it would be nice you know, if there were a Hippocratic Oath for business or for banking. How about for banking? <laughs> or how about for um, you know, investment, investment banking? Uh, or for, uh, but I tell you, I, I gave a talk two weeks ago at the Harvard Business School to 200 like, super high-powered executives who do everything from run the FBI to the, the army to this and that and everything else. And they got bodies. They have minds. They hurt. 
just the way we do. They're fearful. Their minds are always in the future, in the past. They want this stuff, okay? But need to emphasize the ethical foundation. This is for well-being. This is for healing. This is not for harming. This is, and for recognizing how easy it is when we're mindless to actually harm. So, in a sense, it's self-correcting as long as one's in impulses or intentions from the beginning are uh, authentic and open-hearted, then uh, the kindness you show yourself will be a kindness you show your other, to others. And that book that was mentioned, Coming to Our Senses, really is suggesting that if we did this on a planetary scale, the levels of suffering that we are you know, producing for each other and for the planet could actually be modulated and tempered. And everything we've learned in the past 35 or 40 years in medicine, in terms of the mind-body connection and healing, could actually be applied to the body politic in ways that are very, very real. One talk I gave at Davos, uh, not talk, but a, a actual uh, guided meditation at the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, the head of Interpol is there. You know, he showed up at the end, really wanted to talk. I mean, it's like, it's everywhere. It's like you can't make these distinctions. That these are just a bunch of hippies, you know, from the six, left over from the 60s who are like really crazed on LSD, but since they can't get that so easily, they meditate. No, it's not that. It's not that. This is, this is for humans, okay? For human underscore being rather than doing. So in the few remaining moments that we have, uh, and you probably get the sense that we could do this for hours, okay? Um, at least I could do this for hours. I don't know. You know, you're probably hungry. Uh, but uh, let's take a few moments uh, outside of clock time, because we don't have that much clock time. But let's take a few moments outside of clock time and just drop in to the spaciousness of our own awareness. And if that seems too big for you, you can always anchor it in the body sitting here breathing. And just inviting yourself with tremendous gentleness and kindness. Whether you've been meditating for 50 years or whether you, 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 you've never tried this before in any kind of formal way. To just rest here, riding on the waves of your own breathing with full awareness of the body bathing in the air, which we're drinking in and call the breath, and giving out back into the room, and that's caressing the skin, and in silence itself. And just seeing if you can rest in this awareness, and if you're brand new to the practice and you find yourself continually being lost and carried away by thinking or irritability or the sensations in your body, just every time you notice that you're not on the breath or in the body or in awareness anymore, you're already back, but escorting your mind back to the belly or back to the wherever the breath sensations are most predominant in the body. And if the mind wanders a thousand times, then each time with kindness and without judging yourself, just noticing what's on your mind, because that's perfectly valid. It's just another moment, mind moment, and bringing it back to right here. The whole of you sitting here, not just your body, but your heart, your mind. And letting it be a radical act of love, or at least experimenting with the possibility of it being like a profoundly radical act of sanity and of love, to take your seat metaphorically and literally and just be. Fall awake with no agenda, not trying to get anywhere else or feel anything special, but to just be fully awake in and what you already are.
So now if you're uh, sitting with your eyes closed, simply invite your eyes to open, but maintaining the same quality of restfulness in the field of awareness that you're just inhabiting wakefulness itself. And you'll discover that you can be aware of the body sitting with the eyes open, the room, the shadows, the light, the feeling of people on either side of you, in front and back of you. So in a sense, like I, I could ring the bells and say, OK, you could ring some bells and say, OK, this would be the meditation is now over, but I won't ring the bells. <laughs> because the meditation is not going to ever be over. Seriously. Because life is not going to be over as long as it's not over. So we have priceless opportunities, really, moment by moment, to remind ourselves and rebody ourselves. And part of it, and only a part of it, is if you care to do it, but I highly recommend it as a discipline. And you can try it for, say, 20 or 30 years, and then if you don't like it, give it up. <laughs> but, uh, but for the first 20 or 30 years, as the mind argues with you, just do it anyway. Uh, it's really a non-doing. And I didn't really talk about, like, all of the evidence in support of mindfulness nowadays that um, is being marshaled to, um, in some sense, understand the mind better and the nature of mind and the brain and the nature of our interconnectedness and, and then healing of different organ systems and so forth. I will simply say that uh, this has never been a better time to do science on this seeming nothing, because not only do we have the field of neuroplasticity now, which has been demonstrated that the brain itself is an organ of continual experience, and it's continually morphing its, its own structure in relationship to experience. Trauma can actually harm the brain, but therapies of various kinds and physical activity and even what you eat and certainly how you care for the present moment can actually move things in in the direction of like really uh, making sort of all sorts of changes in the uh, activity and even the structure of the brain. And we're just beginning to tease these things out. That science is in its infancy. Another science in its infancy is called epigenetics. That is, it used to be thought that whatever you, genes you got from your mother and father, that's it for you. Forget about it. And now it turns out that that's not true. That by practicing mindfulness, for instance, you can influence the upregulation, it's called in downregulation, of potentially hundreds of genes that are not just random genes, but many of them have to do with uh, cancer, what are called proto-oncogenes, or inflammatory genes. And so again, it's in its infancy. We can't make definitive statements about it, but the evidence is beginning to suggest that this is a power practice for transforming your biology as well as your psychology. And then one element here, Cliff Saren's work with uh, Alyssa Eppel at the University of California, uh, San Francisco, uh, uh, telomeres, which are the kind of shoelace-like tips of your chromosomes. You know, they're, they're repeat subunits of DNA. And every time the cells divide in your body, your body has something north of uh, trillions of cells several trillion cells, all from one fertilized egg, by the way. It's like so deep bow to the mothers in the audience who pulled that up. We still don't know how. Um, that uh, when each time the cell divides, the telomeres get a little shorter. Okay? They are involved in the process of mitosis, you know, and they get a little degraded. Stress degrades them a lot, so they get degraded faster. And uh, when you run out of the shoelace, your cell, that cell, goes into senescence, what's called senescence. In other words, it's, it's basically on the way to being dead. And, what, and research by, uh, by um, 
in what's called the Shamata Project by Cliff Sarin and his collaborators and other people, and now showing that these telomeres can lengthen as a function of meditation practices. Okay? So if you really want to uh, live longer and you find like the present moment really annoying, uh, you have an added incentive that you'll make your shoelaces longer, your DNA shoelaces longer, and maybe live longer. But maybe living longer is not the most important thing. Maybe it's like living fully is the most important thing. Living mindfully, living heartfully, living healthfully, and it may turn out they're all synonymous. Okay? They're all different doors into the same room. And so one size does not fit all, and some of you may be drawn to one practice or another, but I would encourage you to take very seriously the, the challenge or the possibility of finding a way that resonates with you to live your life as if it really mattered, because as it said in the title of this talk, it does, and I like to say, more than you think, and more than you can possibly think, because thinking only carries us so far. So I want to thank you for your attention. We've barely scratched the surface of this, uh, but I want to leave some time for Q&A if you'd like to have a dialogue like this. I won't necessarily be able to answer your questions, but I'm certainly happy to entertain them for a little bit, and then, <laughs> and then we'll move from there. So are there microphones for people who want to ask questions? OK, so I would suggest, are there runners, or should people just line up at the mic? Just go to the microphones in the corridors. In the, so thank you. I want to just end by thanking all of you again and thanking John for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you.